with Dan and Connie from Steeped Games to discuss the replayability of Chai Tea for So let us know a little bit about how you decided to do uh, Chai Tea for Two. You started out with a game for multiplayer and then you decided to go uh, down the hole of uh, two and solo. Yeah, um, well, when we were trying out Chai, we um, wanted something in the same universe, um, but just with um, a little bit more strategic uh, meat to it, and also something that we can play as two people. So um, we kind of started thinking about what, what could work down that road. Um, once we figured out the engine piece, that really got us excited, and everything else kind of built around that in the game. But, yeah, we've yeah. been uh, learning tons about tea the past few years. So we were looking at a tea book and it was saying how tea was uh, processed mm -hmm. in a different plantation. So that's actually sort of what the, um, the player boards are based off of because everything starts from the same uh, tea leaf and then it's how it's oxidized or fermented and uh, or put in the sun or through machines. Uh, it's quite fascinating. So each uh, step going up towards the ships is actually like a major component of how tea is made. Awesome. So did you just get into tea just before making the games? So this wasn't like a lifelong passion? Yeah. I, For me, I'm a bit of a tea hoarder. <laughs> so I think I started collecting tea back in like 2010 or something. Um, yeah, but honestly, I mean, once we really got into designing tea games, we learned so much more, mm. like fermented teas and all that stuff that, um, you know, before I, I just like my, you know, David's tea kind of <laughs> fruity teas kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. we've had a lot of... Um people in the tea community reach out to us because they're just as excited mm -hmm. and they want to, you know, we're very open to people adding and, and, you know, putting their vision into the game too. So uh, we didn't even know at the start that Royabus wasn't truly a tea. It's uh, a herbal because it comes from a different plant. So we just needed a red uh, player for chai. So that seemed to work really well. Um, whereas tea for two is just about the tea leaf um, Camellia sinia, so it has, you know, oolong, green, white, black, uh, yellow, and fermented. So we call it more of a, a tea purist game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, awesome. And, and it's true, like, it's amazing the kind of the facts that you've managed to build into the game. And I love the little blurb you have in the back about the Boston Tea Party and just kind of right. adding that flavor to the game. Totally. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's just so much history about it. We even reached out to uh, the world's leading expert on tea clippers. He was the guy who preserved the Cuddy Sark, uh, which is the most famous one you see in paintings primarily. Uh, and he installed the museum in London. So he was super excited about it. And every day we have tea connoisseurs reaching out. What was that first mechanic that you figured out? And then how did it kind of grow from there? Yeah, uh, well, every year we have... Um, a provincial design conference in Edmonton. So it was actually a week before and we're like, oh no, we haven't made another game. So we better, you know, try to put something together and maybe um, pressure or steam, if you will, will uh, make something happen. So um, we were just looking at the, the tea production chart and realizing there's really no way that we could think of from other games of how, uh, the mechanic is pick up and deliver. How do you move something from the bottom of the chart to the top? So uh, we looked at other games that we enjoyed and we thought, hey, let's put tons of different teas into this and have maybe cards. Maybe the cards could be the engine builder. Um, and that seems to be the case in like Splendor and other um, more gateway games. So we, uh, we tried to make something that was really easy to understand. You just put cards along something and then it bumps up always. Um, accessibility was really huge for us. So. Mm -hmm. Um, actually an earlier version of the game had it where you had to buy a card separately and then do a different action to place the card or to swap it. So you had a whole hand of cards, um, but at a convention, I think it was Shucks in Vancouver, um, there was a little girl that came up to us. She was about seven years old and she's like, I love Chai. My mom and I want to play T for Two. And we realized, oh, this game might be a little bit too hard, um, especially with like holding all the cards and stuff. So in that moment, we changed it where the card is played instantly. Like there's no um, 
hand management or anything like that. And um, she loved it, her mom loved it, and that rule has been here ever since. So uh, yeah, playtesting is really important in making a game. When you talk about just accessibility, and the board just is essentially iconography. Is that an important part of accessibility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for two for two, you know, we tried, <laughs> we thought so hard about even just the lightning symbol and the hourglass. We tried so many different versions of those two symbols or different ideas for them, trying to convey what is immediate and what is um, at the end of the round. Um, so yeah, every single symbol on the board takes a lot of analyzing and thinking through, well, people understand this just by looking at it instead of having to consult the rule book. Um, yeah. Is it graphic? pleasing that part too or does it make sense mm -hmm. um someone commented can we play on the bottom of the board and we're like oh yeah you totally can because there's three little slots um but in our first version of the rule book uh it wasn't explicitly mentioned so even reinforcing um a rule like that by having a card placed in the bottom of a picture um that's something that we we've added recently so yeah just little areas to to tweak things to make it more um I guess consumable, like you're moving barriers from playing is uh, really important. And one of them is also language. So mm -hmm. we're trying not to have any um, instructions on the cards. So on the back side of the little merchants, um, I think I might have some here. Let me try to find them. Uh, there's a little abilities. That's more for the advanced version. So uh, it's very important that we, we picked, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. Oh, there yes. we go. Perfect. Yeah, so that's the swap two cards. Um, yeah, and that person's actually modeled after Connie. So we try <laughs> to put ourselves in the game if we can. But yeah, it shows two cards and then arrows swapping things. So um, if it's intuitive and you can guess at something, it, that's probably how it works. So it, it's gone under undergone a lot of revisions, mm -hmm. but we're really happy with it after the two years. Connie did um, special needs teaching for a couple years. Um, that's incredible. So yeah. yeah, so I taught um, a complex needs class uh, for, yeah, three years, and it was a, a middle school. So very different work than what I'm doing now. Um, and also just very complex in a good way and challenged me both intellectually and emotionally. So I brought a lot of that into designing board games as well. Um, it, just in terms of accessibility, a lot of the um, iconography or looking at um, uh, processes like does this step make sense like are we unnecessarily making it more complicated will people understand it so kind of looking at it through my students eyes a little bit so mm -hmm. um actually we make my mom play all oh yes games. that's true uh, because she's not a gamer um i played chess my whole life so she calls the rooks ashtrays and the bishops elmo um <laughs> yeah i just but if if she can't play our game then we know that it's not ready for families mm -hmm. to play um, so she is like just as important as, well, probably more important than, you know, a seasoned gamer who has 200 games on their Calyx like we do. And um, yeah, like the rest of the world, we just play Monopoly and maybe Catan if we're lucky. So uh, we're super thankful that we can like try to diversify the playtesting group or kids, right? They're also really good to, to learn what's, what's actually being communicated. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, kids give you their honest opinion. Right. They do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the one thing we talked about when we were playing is we, we started with the A side, then we went to the B side. I, I guess you probably answered my question already of which one came first. But when did you decide to, to basically have both versions in the same box? Yeah, definitely the A side. Um, that was the version that we play tested at different conventions before COVID shut down. Um, and then, you know, as we were looking at the A side, we thought something a little bit more complex for the advanced players just to increase replayability would be great. And that's kind of how B side was born. Mm -hmm. We have um, a big notebook of like a C and a D through F basically boards. So um, we thought, it's, it's two-sided, so we might as well have some more game in the box, <laughs> and we'd love to put out more boards in the future. Um, one of our favorites is Castles of Burgundy, and they have like eight or nine different maps of the different hexagons, so like you can't stop playing the game because there's, there's more to discover, basically. So um, we will probably introduce a new rule for every board that we make going forward. Um, and the community, they probably will come up with some awesome ideas, so yeah. 
kind of a, a group think going forward. Yeah, we we definitely loved the also like the motion. We love that you had that kind of basic or introductory one. And then again, you could have that advancement with the power for replayability. You start off on that more basic side just to understand the mechanics of the game. And then right. there are different elements you can upgrade to. So maybe you change those motions first and then you change the board. From our take of that replayability, there was just a lot of little little mini humps and jumps that you could do um, to kind of keep playing that game and getting more and more out of it. You said you spent a lot of time kind of figuring out that iconography. Was there any kind of decision that oh, oh, oh we want to carry through maybe in future games? Notice like in your chai game, you had like the similar tea leaf meeples. Um, are you kind of building things kind of with the, the thought that you can reuse even elements of your game in future productions? Yeah, um, we're not sure what the world of Chai will bring, I guess, down the road. But I mean, we all have, you know, kombucha and there's matcha tea and, and bubble tea. That's been a big request um, or like desserts and stuff. And I think we'll always keep using those characters if we can, um, just because it's kind of... Um, Basically, familiarity allows you to have it more accessible because you feel comfortable. You're like, um, well, well, maybe a basic example would be uh, we have a deck of cards, you know, for the ships or a deck of cards for uh, the market boards. So in hundreds of games, you have a deck of cards and you kind of know that you can take some from it or they get shuffled at the start. And so for us, if someone has played um, maybe T for two and they've never even heard of Chai, then like it's easier for them to be introduced to it because of the different overlap. And we had way too many characters in Chai, so mm -hmm. <laughs> we're trying to, you know, share the love a little bit. So yeah, and we we did think long and hard about whether or not we can mesh the two games together and use the pieces right. in both games somehow. Um, it didn't <laughs> work at the time. We you know played with different ideas. Um, yeah, but who knows? Maybe in the future. <laughs> Kind of like Century Spice Road, yeah. where you can put all three games together. Um, doesn't have to be amazing, but it still works, and it's like this <laughs> epic Sega. Yeah. So we're trying to figure out, like, maybe when the ship sails, then the tea goes into um, a tea the, the base game shot. chai. Yeah. Um, or maybe if you win one of the games, like the points carry over into the next if you play them back to back. So lots of ideas. Well, that sounds like an incredible expansion idea. Maybe that there's multiple pathways to win. Um, like Connie's beat me without shipping any ships. So, as long as one person ships ships, and then the right. other person can collect, you know, blooming teas or whatever. Yeah. yeah and uh, oh, yeah. did you do that? Yeah, just yeah. to try to break the game, right? And yeah, somebody uh, may have walked away from the table. <laughs> yeah, I was shipping all these ships, and she's got like, I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. What? That's the cool thing of the game, because then you learn to slow down. You have to read your opponent, because like, if she's going to sit there and collect cards, I'm like, well, you, I'm not shipping. We'll just wait. Yeah. I'll wait you, and I'll buy all the Bloomington Tees, and I'll buy all the Victory Point cards, too. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you have to bl blame yourself for giving our six Blooming Tees. Yes. I guess pathways, like yeah. crates become very important, or mm -hmm. um, I guess the type of merchant that you are. Like In a lot of games, it kind of forces you to go down a path, um, this one's kind of in the middle where you could still win if you're not getting black cards and you're the black tea merchant. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're always taking stuff that may hinder the other player. So uh, we wanted to make a game that's not as passive aggressive, but is a little bit aggressive. So <laughs> Just a tiny bit. <laughs> you can steal ships if you want, but you could also be Care Bear gamers. If you, you know, you have your ship, that's cool. Go for it kind of thing. So. Yeah. yeah. And I would add to, um, I think the number of ships that you determine that you're going to ship at the beginning, like for um, the end of the game, that changes the game so much. So oftentimes at cons where we're showing, you know, three, three ships and then just to keep it short, short and whatever. But I feel like you really don't get into the meat of the game until you do five. And then you realize, oh my goodness, you can build this elaborate engine and get everything moving up. And it, it just becomes such a, a more elegant game when, when you do the full um, experience. Yeah, there's different strategies. Like, are you going to rush it quick? You could even do that in a five ship game by yeah. getting um, all the wild junk boats because yeah, the other player might only have two and you've done five. So 
uh, that's going to mean you're probably going to buy less cards and then go really heavy on the movement points. So, uh, but the other player might catch up to you. So we mm -hmm. wanted to have a little bit of tension based on, um, again, how many ships are you doing? Is this a slow, medium, or long game? And then what backside of the, the board are you using? Um, the different team merchants, that'll give you more interesting takes on stuff because uh, they're all unique. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we haven't totally explored it ourselves, I guess, but we have play tested it to be sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, and we can't wait right. for your launch um, and to see how the game grows and progresses. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having us. It was awesome meeting you both. Yeah, hope we can in the future.